Friends, grace to you in peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Earlier this summer, Sam and I were visiting my mom in Chicago, and she enlisted our help in cleaning out and reorganizing her bedroom. Sorting through the old papers in a bin next to the desk was quick and mostly uneventful, but every now and then we would stumble upon an old picture to save, or we'd find a legal pad where 20 years ago my dad was sketching out scenes for short stories that he was writing. Of much more interest was pulling out all the drawers in the giant mirrored dresser that has existed in my parents' room for as long as I've been alive, a beast of a piece of furniture that takes up most of the wall. In this dresser, we discovered artifacts of my parents' lives for the last 40 plus years. Lots of old jewelry, most of it not much value, but also a pocket watch belonging to my great-grandmother, some old and beautiful rings, a couple of which came home with me, a grandmother's set of pearls in need of repair, my mom's high school class ring, and her old charm bracelet that I had been infatuated with as a child. In another drawer of the dresser, we found a birth announcement from when my dad was born, and we found a whole stack of insignia patches for my dad's police uniforms and uniform pins as well. We found letters of commission and congratulations from the village for each of my dad's promotions through the police force. We found useless old pens. We found more old pictures. We found some old books. We were faced with a startling moral dilemma of whether to keep a very old and probably valuable illustrated copy of Little Black Sambo, but decided that the deeply and offensively racist illustrations in the book meant that it was probably better destined for the trash bag. To be honest, every item that we evaluated came with that dilemma. Is this item worth keeping or bequeathing or donating or tossing in the trash? And does every item of value need to be kept? There's this tension between keeping and letting go, this fundamental conflict between the desire to cling to stuff and wealth and the desire to rid ourselves of it. It's a conflict that plays out in our American middle-class society in the simultaneous rise in both climate-controlled storage facilities for our extra stuff and things like the tiny house trend, a radical embrace of minimalist living. I mean, it's, there's a reason that Marie Kondo's book, The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up, has flown off the shelves and sparked a Netflix series and has turned the name Kondo into a verb. The way to manage an abundance of possessions that stand in the way of us living our best life, according to Kondo, is to evaluate our belongings in terms of joy. She encourages us to give thanks to the belongings that have served us well as a way of releasing them and letting them go. Or if the condo method doesn't quite do it for you, then you could take a slightly more morbid turn and embrace Margareta Magnusson's take on a Swedish practice called dostedning, which literally translates death cleaning. In her book, the Gentle Art of Swedish Death Cleaning. Magnuson helps us reframe decluttering in terms of being good to those who come after us. The admonishment is to take responsibility for our stuff and not to leave it as a burden for family and friends. Keep the things that have meaning. Keep the things that will be important to those who come after you. Get rid of all the rest. I don't know whether Jesus would consider himself a pioneer in the world of decluttering trends, but perhaps he knows what Kondo and Magnuson and the rest of us do, that a clutter of possessions gets in the way. It gets in the way of joy and relationships. Keeping a clenched fist around our belongings and our wealth cuts off the circulation 
and separates us from God, neighbor, and creation. This is not a new idea for Jesus in Luke's gospel. We are 14 chapters into Luke, and already we can make an impressive list of all of the times that we've heard the warning that love of possessions and wealth are incompatible with the call to discipleship and Christ's kingdom. While Jesus is still in the womb, Mary sings about how the hungry will be filled with good things and the rich will be sent away empty. John the Baptist tells a nervous crowd that the way to prepare for Jesus' ministry is to share their extra stuff with people who need their extra stuff. Jesus shows up and states in no uncertain terms that his mission is to bring good news to the poor. In Luke, Jesus preaches the Beatitudes, and they are not spiritualized like in Matthew's gospel. Matthew's Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, but Luke's Jesus says, blessed are the poor, full stop. And Jesus also says, woe to those who are rich, full stop. Jesus has already sent out the disciples with nothing, no food, no money, no staff, no bag, no bread, to teach them about the sufficiency of the kingdom. Jesus chastises those who want to follow him, but only after managing their affairs back at home first. He tells a parable of a rich fool who values his stuff more than his life. He tells the disciples to sell their possessions and to give alms, to make purses for themselves that do not wear out, an unfailing treasure in heaven. And he tells us that where our treasure is, there our heart will be also. And friends, we are only halfway through Luke's gospel. Jesus is clear. The pursuit of wealth and possessions is at odds with the pursuit of the kingdom of God. Relentless pursuit of wealth and possessions damages our relationships, cuts us off from each other, destroys the earth, drains our joy, creates burdens. Jesus instead calls disciples to pursue God's kingdom, and he warns them that this will come at a steep cost. It will require you to leave everything behind. The burden and the release of carrying the cross is that it frees you from the weight of all other things of this world. And so there's a question that is lurking behind our gospel reading today. What is it about Jesus and the kingdom of God that makes it worth it to give up my wealth, my family, my home, my life? It's a question that Jesus doesn't really answer in our gospel reading today. Today, he tells us to count the cost, to prepare ourselves for the demands of discipleship. He shows us the stick, but not the carrot. So we need to back up a few verses in Luke's gospel for that. Jesus tells a parable right before today's reading, a parable of a great banquet. A host prepares an extravagant meal, a meal of provision and joy, abundance and love, a meal freely given, freely offered, an invitation generously extended. This meal is a picture of what God offers us in Christ and what the kingdom of God looks like, a kingdom of provision and joy, abundance, love, grace and rest, celebration and generosity, a place where the meal is offered freely, whose host is Jesus, a space where there are no greater or lesser seats, but all places at the table are seats of honor, a kingdom where health and life and hope are offered for all whose bodies and souls are hungry. But in the parable, when the first round of invites goes out, they are met with resistance. I have just bought a piece of land and need to tend it. Sorry. I've just purchased some new livestock and want to try them out, maybe some other time. I have recently been married, so I send my regrets. Jesus has invited you to the banquet, my friends. He has laid before you a table overflowing with bread and wine, an abundance of grace and life. This is the carrot 
a banquet in the kingdom of God where you and all are fed, where there is peace, where there is joy, where there is no more oppression or pain or division or death. Jesus has done the calculations. This banquet is worth your life. It's a banquet for which he is about to give his life, and he invites us to do the same. And so that's the question that comes out of today's gospel for us, the personal question. What is it that keeps us from joining the banquet? Where do we put our trust? Where do we put our sense of faithfulness and responsibility? In God? In ourselves? In our belongings? What are we hoarding and consuming and possessing? Or what is consuming and possessing us? Jesus doesn't give us much of a strategy for cleaning out the clutter besides give it all up. He doesn't give us a method for discerning what is enough and what is too much. He simply tells us to let go, for the kingdom he offers is more than enough. He gives us permission to detach from our things because he has the one treasure worth possessing. He tells us to clear away everything that gets in the way of saying yes to the dinner invitation because we are worthy of the invite just the way we are. Holy decluttering like this can take many forms. For some of the early church fathers, the desert fathers as they're called, this meant living a truly ascetic life, moving to the wilderness, living in caves, denouncing all worldly possessions. For other faithful people, past and present, holy decluttering has meant entering into monastic orders or taking vows of simplicity. For some, this has meant coming together into intentional Christian communities defined by shared wealth and shared possessions. For you, holy decluttering might mean a thorough house cleaning and many trips to the depot. It might inspire you to make a bigger decision, like moving into a smaller home. It might mean that you start thinking differently about how you approach birthday and Christmas gift giving, or it might mean finding ways to borrow and share more. It might mean committing to reusing what you have and using sustainable items instead of their disposable counterparts. I don't know what holy decluttering will look like for you, but I know that Jesus calls you to do the work of discernment to count the cost of the kingdom in prayer and in faith, to discern how God is calling you to give up or to use what you have in service of God and in love toward neighbor and in care for creation. Jesus tells us that where our treasure is, there our heart will follow. God's kingdom, that great banquet set before us, is that true pearl of great price, It is the treasure we carry in clay jars. It is the one coin worth casting aside all of our furniture to find. Jesus says, I freely offer you the riches of the kingdom and the life that is for everlasting. Come to the banquet, for the invitation is wide open. This is the treasure. Is your heart ready to follow? Amen.